Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I'm Laura Lubbers and I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy or CURE. I'm delighted to have you with joining us today. Today's webinar is entitled Seizure Emergencies and Current Rescue Medications and it will be presented by Dr. Camille Desnecki. This is the first installment of a two-part webinar series that will describe seizure emergencies and review available rescue medications and touch on those that are in development. We will also review when and how rescue medications should be administered. Today's webinar is being sponsored by our friends at the Band Foundation. CURE's mission is to find a cure for epilepsy by promoting and funding patient-focused research. CURE's robust grants portfolio has advanced epilepsy research across areas such as infantile spasms, post-traumatic epilepsy, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP, and epilepsy genetics. Dr. Jetnecki is an assistant professor of clinical neurology at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine and an attending epileptologist at the University of Miami Hospital and Clinics and Jackson Memorial Hospital. He's the director of the Clinical Trials Research Program in Epilepsy at the University of Miami, and he is the principal investigator of several clinical research studies. Dr. Jetnecki is duly board certified in neurology and epilepsy by the American Board of Psychi Psychi I'm sorry, Psychiatry and Neurology. Before Dr. Jetnecki begins, I'd like to encourage everyone to ask questions. You may submit your questions anytime during the presentation by typing, typing them into the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your Zoom panel and clicking send. My colleague from CURE, Brandon Laughlin, will read them aloud during the Q&A portion of the webinar. We do want this webinar to be as interactive and informative as possible. However, to respect everyone's privacy, we ask that you make your questions general and not specific to a loved one's epilepsy. I also want to mention that today's webinar, as well as all previous and future webinars, will be recorded and are available on the CURE website. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Jetnecki. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Camille Jetnecki. I'm happy to be here and talk about this important topic, which are uh, epilepsy emergencies. Before I begin, here are my disclosures. I received research support uh, to Yale University for several investigative initiated studies from uh, these companies, ASI, Sunovian, Accorda, and Absher Smith. And I also received honoraria from UCB for an advisory board. So the key objectives of this uh, webinar today is to understand the definition of epilepsy emergencies and the importance of treatment. Uh, then I will talk about the uh, current rescue medications options and why an in, in individualized plan is needed. So we'll focus on two epilepsy emergencies and one is seizure clusters or also called acute repetitive seizures and the next one is status epilepticus. So what are seizure clusters? Uh, basically, there's not a good definition for seizure clusters, but the patients who have it, they all know what that is. And basically, it's a closed group series of seizures that are distinct from the baseline seizure frequency or seizure pattern. And you can see different names being used for seizure clusters, such as acute repetitive seizures, cluster seizures, serial seizures, crescendo, flurry, bouts of increased seizure activity, they all mean the same. And there are definitions mostly are based on, on time. So the most commonly used are greater or equal to two to three seizures in six or in 24 hours. And it can be seizures of any type. And they are most commonly seen in patients who have medically refractory or intractable epilepsy. And that can happen in any type of epilepsy patient. Uh, it's important to know about this uh, phenomenon because they have the potential of progressing into something called status epilepticus that has, uh, it's another emergency that can cause uh, permanent brain damage and, and can have uh, uh, 
consequences in the long term. So status epilepticus, on the other hand, um, it, it has two definitions. For many years, uh, uh, call it the old definition, which was a greater than 30 minutes of continuous convulsive activity, uh, which is really long time to have a what people used to call the grand mal seizure, convulsive seizure, for greater than 30 minutes, or having two or more seizures where the patient does not recover fully within, between the seizures. And now there is a more newer definition, which uh, uh, we believe is more practical, which is uh, we reduce the time of greater than five minutes of continuous convulsive activity or more than two seizures without full recovery between them. And the purpose of treatment with rescue medications are um, number one, to can be used to stop ongoing, ongoing seizure cluster. So patient has a pattern of clusters and has series of seizures that come in a group and you use a rescue medication to prevent having more seizures in the cluster, to shorten the duration of the cluster. There are um, rescue medications used to stop an ongoing seizure. So for example, someone has a very long seizure lasting for several minutes and you use a medication to shorten that duration. And uh, can also be used as prevention. If there is a patient in a situation that it has a high risk of having a seizure, and for example, missing medication, being sick, um, some patients may use a rescue medication to prevent a seizure in the short term. So what are these rescue medications? So uh, these are antiepileptic drugs that are used to stop seizures quickly to prevent emergency situations. They are designed to be absorbed quickly by the body and start working in the brain as fast as possible. They're not taken every day, they're taken as needed only in emergency situations. And they do, they do not replace your daily antiepileptic drugs. When should we use rescue medication? Well, it's really not an answer for every patient because every epilepsy patient is different, every seizure is different. So it's a decision that has to be individualized between the patient, the caregiver, and the treating physician, taking into account what's the baseline seizure frequency, what's the tolerance to the seizures, and the consequences of the seizures, and the effect of the rescue medication. Ideally, a patient should have a seizure action plan, as shown here on the right side of the screen, and where patient has a description of the seizures and a plan of what to do in each situation. What these situations may be, could be seizure clusters. For example, if the patient has X number of seizures, they should use the rescue medication, or when the seizures are lasting longer than normal, or when they're more severe than normal, um, or maybe a patient has the aura of a warning that has enough time to use something to prevent the seizure from coming. Why should we bother? Why we should treat seizure emergencies? Because with these emergencies, there's a higher risk of going to the hospital to being admitted or going to the emergency room. There's a risk of injury, loss of work or study uh, that being associated with lower quality of life and possibly even higher mortality. Uh, status epilepticus, uh, which may be a complication of clusters if they left untreated can lead to long-term consequences and increased mortality. And, and there's many studies that have shown that the sooner we act, the sooner we treat um, these emergencies, the better the outcome. Here's an example of a patient that had a prolonged uh, uh, episode of status epilepticus, a prolonged seizure that was not stopping on its own. And you can see the changes on the MRI during this emergency, you can see on on the, on the part of the brain that it's bright is when the seizures were occurring. And six months later, there's shrinkage of that part of the brain uh, showing that there was some permanent damage to the brain. That's why it's so important to prevent those situations. Ideally, the treatment of a seizure emergency should start outside of the hospital, even before the paramedics arrive and before you're in the emergency room. There was a large study showing that um, 
patients that were treated before being admitted to the hospital, patients with status epilepticus with, with this class of medications called benzodiazepines, had better outcomes than patients that were um, treated with placebo, which meant not, not the drug. And, and I showed here, you, you may be all familiar with slogans used for a stroke, showing that time is brain. I think this is as important for seizures because the longer the seizure progress, the, the more chance of, of losing neurons and having consequences. There are, um, luckily we have more treatment options than we had uh, uh, until recently. Um, for many years, the only option FDA approved for treating a cluster of seizures and, uh, and epilepsy emergencies has been uh, diazepam rectal gel. They may be familiar with the brand name Diastar. And in, as of a few months ago, there's a new medication that's approved that it's a nasal spray. It's another medication called midazolam, which is in, in a class of benzodiazepines. Um, that is not yet commercially available, but uh, should be soon, and maybe a good alternative for patients that may not want to use the rectal route of administration. There are many medications that patients have been using what we call off-label, which means it's not FDA approved for that indication, but we know they work. And there are um, medications such as clonazepam, diazepam, lorazepam, midazolam. Those are all the same class of medications, benzodiazepines, patients are using uh, in different routes, orally, vocally in the cheek, and as well as some medications that are being used uh, in the nasal spray. Some physicians direct patients to take another dose of their medication um, when they're having an emergency. And many patients uh, don't do anything, they wait for the seizure to stop. And that may be the option for some patients, and but it's important to discuss all the options with your neurologist. So uh, the diazepam rectal gel, um, it's uh, approved for patients two years in, of age and older, and uh, the benefits are that it works fast, that um, there are some generic forms available, and we have a long experience with that medication, so we know what to expect. Uh, the drawbacks, um, really is the route of administration and so there is a loss of dignity and the, um, you know loss of privacy and it's problematic to administer in public places and in schools so because of that it's really used mostly in children or patients who are institutionalized and but many uh, active adults are reluctant to use it for obvious reasons so in that case we have a different option which is now uh, at the midazolam nasal spray that was recently approved by the FDA uh, under the name of nasolam. Um, and uh, the benefits of this medication is that also works fast, similar to the diazepam rectal gel, and, but it's uh, less invasive and, and, and patients uh, potentially can self-administer. And the drawbacks uh, are that they may cause some nasal irritation and patients when they're having a cold or nasal drainage, we don't know well what how this would affect the absorption of this medication. I wanted to know that a lot of patients have been using uh, the IV formulation of midazolam uh, nasally. And uh, you may be instructed by your neurologist and get instructions of how to use that. Um, it is an option until the uh, FDA approved nasal midazolam gets in, into the pharmacies and uh, patients use this IV formulation into a syringe with an atomizer or they can be put in the in the metal dose nasal sprayer. So we talk about this class of medications called the benzodiazepines. Again, diazepam, midazolam, all the medications end with an M at the end. Um, those are uh, medications that have potential side effects of sedation and sleepiness, and patients, after they use it, they may feel tired and sleepy. There is a potential for respiratory distress, particularly patients who have pulmonary disease or, or breathing problems or are very sick, 
and, and there is a, also a potential of abuse in this class of medications and the potential of tolerance, which means if you use the medications um, regularly, there is a potential that it, your body gets used to them and doesn't work as well. So I wanted to discuss a few cases uh, and where um, patients are using rescue medication as an example. So we have a patient, Sarah, who's 24 years old. She has a cluster of eight or more myoclonic seizures, which are brief jerks. They usually occur in the morning and, uh, and they, they happen more around her menstrual period. And she knows that if she has two or more seizures, she will have several that day. So she uses intranisomidazolam to prevent having more seizures that day. Richard, it's a eight year old boy with convulsive seizures, the, uh, the so-called grand mal seizures. And they can be very prolonged if he's sick with fever and it may last up to 20 minutes. And usually the mom calls the ambulance and, and the boy is taken to the hospital. But mom started using rectal diazepam uh, if she noticed that the seizure is lasting more than five minutes and that has really shortened the duration of, of his seizures and avoids him going to the ear each time that this happens. Another example is Jessica who's 38 years old. She has seizures only at night and if she's very stressed and doesn't sleep well, she may have auras of feeling strange during the day and she usually has a seizure that night. So she takes a lorazepam if, she, if that situation happens where she has the auras and, and she uses that to prevent having a seizure at night. So this was, uh, I don't wanna take more time of the questions and uh, the questions are very important and uh, I see here um, questions. So yes, we do have questions. Uh, I know some have already come in. Uh, if you have other questions, if there are other questions from our audience, um, please do submit them through the Q&A tab located at the bottom of your screen and click send and Brandon will go ahead and read them aloud. Okay, uh, so I'll read a question um, from CT Mom. Uh, I have a teenager with a seizure disorder. He takes medications to control them on a daily basis. If he were to have a seizure and it went longer than three minutes, uh, uh, longer than three minutes out, seizure action plan is to administer the diastat. We have used. Uh, well, I'm not sure what's the question here, but I think it's a great idea. Um, and, and I think uh, you're showing an example here of, of uh, an appropriate use of a rescue medication trying to prevent uh, a prolonged seizure from happening. I have another question here. Are these medications combined with other treatments or solo treatments? That's an excellent question. Um, these medications are not supposed to replace the daily uh, antiepileptic medications that you take. These are only to be used in, um, in situations of emergencies. So, uh, so yeah, they are combined. You continue taking your daily medications and this is extra in case of a, a situation that requires treatment. Uh, also to help you out, uh, Camille, I got, I got a couple of questions that came in um, uh, through email as well. Um, and these actually are dealing with uh, some of the differences um, between, uh, between rescue medications. Um, are there differences in effectiveness uh, uh, between uh, the different delivery methods and, uh, of, of um, rescue medications? such as buccal or uh, nasal or? So um, the important is that these medications get to the system as fast as possible. And there are not good uh, studies comparing one to another because um, it's very hard to make a study like that, uh, that it's uh, unbiased and, uh, and blinded. Normally we wanna do a study that is blinded that you don't know 
which medication you're taking, whether uh, it's placebo or not. So there's no good studies comparing them, but uh, they, they, there have been some uh, comparing uh, with, um, with the rectal diazepam, with nasomidazolam, and they seem to be comparable. Um, so th we don't have evidence that one is better than the other. There's just, uh, at this point, preference on, on the route of administration. Great, thank you. Um, and the other question that kind of goes along with that, um, are there, um, you, you mentioned quickly about the, the side effects uh, that, um, um, or, or the side effects of some of the, some of the rescue medications. Um, are there any differences between those side effects um, depending on the type of delivery method that you use? Yes, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, the nasal administration has the potential for irritation in the nose and and, and so that's one uh, type of side effect. And also, the, um, theoretically, the medications have different half-lives, which means they may stay in your system longer. So for example, uh, diazepam has a longer, stays in your system longer. So potentially, um, you may feel an effect of sedation for a longer time than, for example, midazolam that is a shorter time. But um, in some patients, that may be also be beneficial because there's maybe a longer protection for the seizures. So, um, uh, you know, they are each may be better for one patient than versus others. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, actually, a question that came in um, before even the webinar started um, was dealing with uh, with um, uh, nasal rescue medications. And the question was, is, is the research suggesting that uh, these medications such as nasolam um, will be effective? Uh, the question is whether they are, they are effective. Yeah, um, absolutely. There was, um, for the nasomidazolam, there was um, a large study that was a multi-center study where they uh, compare this medication with placebo which the placebo means there's a dummy medication also that looks the same way as the, as the real medication. And in fact, the study showed that, uh, that the nasal midazolam was uh, um, much more effective than, than using the, the dummy medication. And that's what we use in, and that's what the FDA used to approve this medication. Great, um, actually a question came in about um, uh, the slide dealing with the, 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 the definition of status epilepticus. Yes. Um, and and uh, not sure if the five minute mark uh, will be reduced for pediatric patients to say two to three minutes for status epilepticus definition. Yeah, you know, the physicians have this problem that they, uh, you know, they, they're never perfect. And um, this is what we have right now. And I think that, again, in terms of when to treat, it's different. So you, you may have a definition saying that status epilepticus is five minutes, but this doesn't mean that we need to wait five minutes in order to start treatment. And that is what has been shown based on animal and human data, that if a seizure goes for five minutes or longer, there is a, a less likelihood that it will stop on its own. But... Um, uh, I think that absolutely, that for some patients, uh, if a seizure is one, two minutes long, it may be too long for them. So uh, every patient is different. But it, uh, I'm not aware of the, any uh, that, that we're changing that definition. Wonderful. And we're getting a lot of good questions that are coming in here. Um, uh, one of the, the questions actually um, talks a little bit more about seizure action plans. And um, uh, the attendee would like to know, um, what would you say to say school teachers or um, school personnel who refuse to administer uh, rectal medications? Yeah, there's been a lot of debate about that and, 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 and having the, um, the school administer those medications. And, and I think that um, the, the problem with the rectal administration may be resolved now that we have nasal and um, because again uh, rectal is uh, you know 
it's troublesome and in, in, in invading in, 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 in patients' privacy. But now that we have the option of NISA, hopefully um, that won't be a problem. Great, thank you. Um, actually, uh, another question came in um, specifically about diastat. And uh, they want to know if diastat can be given twice at one time if the seizures persist uh, after the first dose, or do you have to wait um, a certain period of time between doses? Yeah, so uh, typically the dose is uh, calculated by weight, and um, there, there is a Usually, there is a possibility of giving another dose, and but uh, I would normally wait, uh, you know, at least more than ten minutes before the doses to know if the if the if the, if the first dose took an effect, and we have to always assess whether um, the patient is not overly sedated, is not having any difficulty breathing, um, but um, those uh, discussions about the dose need to be specific addressed with with the neurologist. I can't give you an answer for everybody. But to answer shortly, yes, there are the, in some patients we can. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, how, uh, is there an average length um, of how long um, it, it takes for a rescue medication to take effect? Yes. and. It really uh, um, it depends on the type of rescue medications. The um, the oral medications they take much longer, and that's why we're uh, uh, we're so um, excited to have different routes of administration. Um, because if you swallow a pill, it may take you know 20 minutes or more to start working. Which, in a case of a, for example, a convulsion going on for a long time, it's it's unacceptable. Nasal uh, uh, maybe work as um, you know, as fast as, as 10 minutes, um, and um, and there are new uh, medications that are being um, searched in uh, and, and they're being researched that may work even faster, as fast as IV. So uh, there's different times depending on, on the type of the medication and the route of administration. But the fastest that we have right now are, um, you know, the rectal and the nasal. Uh, another question that came in actually deals with um, um, the, the forms, you know, versus nasal lamp. Sorry, you, you, it, it broke when, when you said, you said the difference between Verset and nasal lamp? Yes, yeah, they wanted to know kind of what the difference is between the two. Yeah, so the active compound is the same. So Verset is the brand name of midazolam, which is the same compound that it's in this uh, brand name nasal lamp. The main difference is that when you use the off-label uh, midazolam, like I, I show this picture uh, of, of this uh, young kid getting the the, the verset with um, with a syringe or a spray, is that um, because it's been uh, we're using a, a product that it's been developed for IV, it's uh, very diluted, so you you need to um, use much more volume or more, much much more amount of liquid that it actually doesn't all get absorbed and it drips behind the nose. So um, it's not ideal. This product um, that um, was FDA approved, Nasalam, is a much smaller concentration, so it's just one dose. And, and uh, so that, um, uh, that is an improvement in the, in, in compared to the off-label. But the actual medication that is being used is the same. Wonderful. Um, if you uh, use the nasal spray um, to stop a seizure and is not effective, uh, can you actually switch rescue medications and then give diastat? Um, is that possible? Um, I, this is, these are great questions that need to be addressed, and that's why it's important to have a, a, a rescue plan. Every rescue plan needs to have an option, well, what if the rescue medication doesn't work? When is the moment that, uh, can you use another dose? Should you call 911? Again, this is not an answer for everyone. And it really depends on, on the age of the patient and, uh, and, the, and, and the dose that is being given. So um, using different types of uh, rescue medication at the same time, um, 
it's possible, it's unusual. Usually we try to use, uh, uh, there are rescue medications that you can repeat after, uh, let's say five or 10 minutes, you can give another dose of the same one. Using a different one, uh, it's not that commonly used, but um, but it, it's possible. But this is something that um, should be uh, discussed and patients should ask that to their neurologist. And it's, I think it's again important to, to, to have a rescue plan where we discuss this, uh, situations, you know, what to do when one medication doesn't work, can I use a second dose, when should I call 911, and so on. Absolutely, for sure, uh, great recommendation. Um, another question uh, that came in, uh, if a patient is already on a benzo, um, such as Omphi, uh, as part of their daily AED regime, um, are the rescue meds gonna be more or less effective? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so the, the the good answer is uh, it's possible. So there are there is a phenomenon of uh, of tolerance to benzodiazepines, and so if a patient is on on onfi or clobazam, which is a benzodiazepine that takes every day, it's possible that they may require a higher dose of a rescue medication than a person who is not used to take benzodiazepines. And um, this is something that uh, it's going to need more research for the newer medications. Uh, in the uh, for the new medication nasalam, the patients that were in the study were not allowed to be on those medications, and so we we're going to need to have more more information about it. It's definitely not a contraindication, um, but it may be that uh, the patients may notice that they may require a higher dose. Great answer, thank you. Um, a question came in uh, also kind of going back to seizure action plans. Um, are there resources um, made available yet uh, for uh, say school personnel um, or uh, other professionals um, on how to use rescue medications? Um, you know, are there any resources that exist out there that you know of? Yeah, I think that um, the Epilepsy Foundation it's a great resource, and they have examples of uh, rescue medication plan, and um, and uh, so um, I think that's 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 one great source of, of information. Great. Um, what a uh, question came in um, uh, again, going back to kind of delivery methods, which um, are going to be addressed in, in a future webinar. Uh, but are are there sublingual rescue medications that would work more quickly than a pill, um, such as like a liquid lorazepam? Um, would it work more quickly uh, sublingually? Um, yes, people are use, using that. Um, uh, it's, uh, people are using uh, lorazepam or clonazepam vocally or sublingually. Um, there, um, the, I think the exact absorption has not been studied as well but um, there is a there is a potential that it works faster than than swallowing the pill. Although this, uh, uh, you know, many of these pills are not meant to be used sublingually, so they may not dissolve as fast. And for using sublingual, um, but you know, liquid formulation, and so on, uh, it's it's um, it's definitely an an alternative. There are again companies trying to develop a different products, and I think we'll talk in the next seminar about it, but there are companies using, for example, a film that it's used in the cheek that delivers medications and get absorbed faster through the mucosa. So it's an active area of research looking for different routes of administration. Great. Um, lots of questions coming in about, um, you know, the timing of how long people should wait. Um, so uh, one question came in for a child who has had a history of um, um, refractory epilepticus, when would it be great, or when would it be ideal to administer uh, the, res the rescue medications um, and when to call 911? Uh, this person uh, in particular is not comfortable waiting five minutes. Yeah, so um, the answer is right there. If you're not comfortable waiting five minutes, it's you shouldn't do that. Um, it's really, um, there's not an answer for everyone. And, and that's why uh, uh, going back to my presentation, I, I mentioned that rescue medication, it's, 
when to administer, it should be a decision between the, the patient, caregiver, and the doctor, depending on their, on their usual seizures, uh, what kind of seizures they have. For example, uh, you may be willing to, la to wait longer if you're having a focal motor seizure, which is a seizure where you have, for example, motor activity without loss of awareness. They can go on for several minutes without causing any significant harm to the patient, but a generalized convulsion generalized tonic-clonic seizure um, going on for, for five minutes, it, it, it can be potentially a concern. So um, I really cannot answer this question in this particular child without knowing his history and his previous, uh, the type of seizures that he's had, but uh, it's something that um, definitely, if, a, if the child had refractory status epilepticus, they should have a rescue medication and they should, um, Talk to the neurologist about a, a rescue plan and, and when to administer the medication. But I can't make a recommendation just without knowing all the details. Yes, and thank you, Dr. Danyaki. Um, we have a couple questions left, so if, if anybody um, has any additional questions, please go ahead and type them in now. Um, uh, one question came in, again, uh, dealing with delivery methods. And um, should individuals administering um, you know, say Ativan, for example, be concerned about putting a tablet in the mouth of somebody that's having a tonic-clonic seizure? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's probably not the best way to administer medication in this type of seizure. Uh, when you're having a generalized tonic-clonic seizures, usually um, you need something that works fast. A pill may not get absorbed well. There's uh, often a lot of secretions from the mouth, salivation, drooling, that may prevent this, the the medication to get absorbed. And also, um, as the person mentions here, they worry about um, getting injured, the, the person who delivers the medication, because uh, during a seizure, may, patients may clench their teeth uh, involuntarily. So I would suggest using something different, uh, um, either um, rectal diazepam or nasal midazolam probably will be a better uh, way to administer the medication rather than a pill in this situation. Great, thank you. Um, kind of a general question that came in, uh, but actually uh, came in, in many different forms. Um, so maybe uh, I know you kind of uh, discussed uh, the differences between some of the benzos uh, that are out there, um, but uh, maybe you can kind of give a quick review of what are some of the, the, the main differences um, between the rescue medications uh, that are currently available to, to patients. Yeah, so um, the, the, risk, the, the type of medication that we have available, we have the, the ones that are specifically FDA approved for rescue are the nasal midazolam that was recently approved, and, um, and we have the rectal diazepam. The difference are, those are two different medications. You can call them cousins. They are the same family of medications, benzodiazepines, that are sedatives. Uh, but they work uh, great at, at stopping seizures. Um, the diazepam has a, stays in your system for a longer time, and, and then the midazolam, they both uh, work um, similarly fast. It gets absorbed fast. One is through, uh, through the mucosa uh, in the nose. The other one is rectally. Um, but uh, those are the, the, the two main differences. And then we have um, oral medications that people use that typically take much longer to work. We're talking about if you swallow a pill probably in terms of you know, 15, 20 minutes, even more before it starts working. So if you need something to stop a seizure, probably um, rectal or nasal will be the best thing. If you have a cluster that you have hours apart between seizures, oral, it's a good alternative because you have enough time for the medication to get absorbed. So it really depends on the pattern and the type of uh, seizures and what are you trying to achieve? Is it, are you trying to prevent something in the next few hours or are you trying to stop an ongoing seizure right now as soon as possible? And depending on that, different uh, medications may be a you know, better, better choice. Good, thank you, Dr. Janiecki. Um Actually, uh, kind, of, kind of one final question uh, that came in, um, kind of dealing with um, the research behind rescue medications. Um, are there any studies on the efficacy of a VNS for rescue purposes? Um, you know, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. There is a, 
not that much uh, research on that. We know VNS, um, uh, it works uh, uh, at, uh, well at preventing seizures, but uh, there are um, definitely a lot of anecdotal patients, and I hear a lot of patients who are using the magnet and, and to, to, to abort the seizures. So um, my, my answer to that is that um, uh, if people notice that, they, uh, that it works, they, they should use it. Definitely, there is no drawback from that. And the side effects of using the magnet are uh, minimal, except some potential uh, irritation to the throat and during the VNS. Um, um, what a magnet does is it activates the VNS. It gets sends an, the VNS normally sends a, a current every few minutes, whether you're having a seizure or not, day or night. But if you're having a seizure, you're having an aura, if you fire a magnet, it usually delivers an, uh, delivers an extra current, and, and, and often it's a higher current than what we use normally. So um, definitely that it has worked for some people, yeah. But there's no large-scale studies um, as we did with other rescue medications. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to Laura now. Um, and uh, again, thank you, Dr. Janiecki. Thank yeah. you. So this concludes our webinar about seizure emergencies and available rescue medications. I want to thank you, Dr. Jetnicki, for such great advice and especially highlighting the need for a seizure action plan. Now, there's more information out there, but we do encourage people to build their seizure action plan in conjunction with their physician. I also want to thank the Band Foundation for sponsoring today's webinar and the entire webinar series in 2019. And of course, our awesome uh, audience for asking so many wonderful questions. If you have additional questions about this topic or wish to learn more about any of CURE's research programs, please feel free to visit our website at www.cureepilepsy.org. Finally, uh, we hope you will join us for our future webinars, including the second installment of our CURE's Rescue Medication webinar series, which will continue to explore rescue medication delivery methods, and future therapies. And it will be presented by Dr. Nathan Fountain uh, from the University of Virginia on September 10th. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. Have a great day.